Okay. So the first talk is going to be given by Francisca Caballero, who is from the National Center for Metallurgical Research in Madrid, in Spain. And she's going to be entertaining us with her talk about the distribution of atoms in nanostructure bainite. So, okay. Francisca. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, the work I'm about to present is a collaboration between the Spanish National Center for Metallurgical Research and our National Laboratory. And in this work, what we have done is just to track car carbon um, uh, distribution during binary reaction at the atomic scale using atom proof tomography. I, I believe that the most of you know that uh, there has been, since the discovery of binary, there has been mm, much discussion on the mechanisms that uh, control this transformation. If you check early literature, uh, you can find at least two very different explanations of how this reaction takes place. You can read that uh, binary transformation is a displacive uh, transformation. That's a displacive theory that states that binary ferrite for Beicher and that the transformation is essentially martensitic in nature. That means that individual atoms will not move less than one interatomic spacing during the reaction. In the literature for the same, uh, for the same years, at the same time you can read the opposite explanation, the binitic, uh, uh, binary transformation is a reconstructed transformation and the transformation takes place by movement of thermal activated atoms and that uh, by nitiferite uh, uh, growth by the, um, the movement of uh, growth uh, length uh, on both phases of the interface. However, today, I think, I believe it's generally accepted that by night transformation is a displacive transformation. And that occurs since uh, experimental evidence on the invariant uh, um, plane strain surface relief effects uh, were provided by Professor Badicia using atomic force microscopy. However, displacive transformation does not always implies diffusionless transformation. And nowadays the discussion is focused on the role of carbon uh, during the reaction, on the role of carbon on the binitiferite uh, growth process. And if you read literature nowadays, you can find, again, two different explanations. You can read that uh, binitiferite uh, growth supersaturated in carbon. And after that plate of binitiferite is four, the carbon will partition into the austenite or can precipitate inside the binitiferite plate uh, uh, at lower temperature, forming what we know lower by night. That, that diffusion-less explanation. But uh, nowadays, you can also read that the transformation, the binary ferrite growth, is a carbon diffusion control process, and it's completely the same transformation, the same type of transformation that we must have in ferrite. And binary uh, ferrite growth is carbon diffusion control, and if we have precipitation during the reaction, cementite will precipitate on the austenite ferrite interface at the same time that it's moving. What we have to do to check what is the process that is taking place during binary ferrite growth? Uh, what we need to do is just to uh, study, investigate the very early moment of the transformation when we have the very first binary ferrite plate and to measure the carbon content in that plate. If the carbon content corresponds to the carbon in the parent austenite, then we have for sure a diffusionless process. If the carbon content is much lower and corresponds to that given by the equilibrium, then the growth for sure will be a control, uh, dif carbon diffusion control growth. But unfortunately, and you can understand why from this very simple calculation of carbon diffusion, for the temperatures at which by night is four, that can be between 400, 450 degrees C, the time needed to de fully decarburate that very first binary ferrite plate, it will, be, it will be less than a second. Then we cannot investigate uh, from an experimental point of view that very early moment. What have we been doing all these decades? 
In a stage, we have looked at the carbon content in the residual astenite uh, when the transformation had finished. And that's uh, the, what we call the incomplete reaction phenomenon. Uh, and it's an indirect uh, validation of the diffusionless nature of the transformation. What we do is just to measure, for instance, by X-ray analysis, the carbon content in the retaining austenite. And if uh, that carbon content, when the transformation has finished, follow the thermodynamic uh, limit, the, this AE3 line, then we can state that the growth was during the transformation carbon diffusion control. But if instead the carbon content is much lower and follow what we call the TO limit, then we can state that, that the growth was diffusionless. And that's why, what the TO line means. The TO the T line, what it means is that when the carbon content, when the transformation has stopped and we have that carbon content in a balance of energy, of free energy, this is free energy and this is temperature. On a balance of free energy, that will mean that beyond this point, transform austenite to by ferrite of the same composition by the diffusionless process will be forbidden according to thermodynamics because we will increase the energy forward system and all we know that that's not possible. Then even that we have lower amount of carbon in the retinal stenite than the equilibrium, even that we have not approached the equilibrium and we still have retinal stenite, the transformation will stop. That's what we call the incomplete reaction phenomenon and we have been validated the bionitic ferrite growth process looking at this phenomena. And on the right you can have a, a for instance, a experimental uh, test where we look at the by x-ray analysis and the incomplete reaction phenomenon and the TO line. And you can see we measure the austenite carbon content with the transformation had finished uh, after the austenite decomposition of a medium carbon high silicon steel at different temperatures. And it's quite clear that when we transform, when we decompose austenite in the bionic region between BS and MS, the carbon content when the transformation has been complete follow the TO line. And over BS, when we transform to with mass and ferrite, and we still have it in austenite, and we make sure that avoid precipitation of cementite, it follows the paraequilibrium value. This is an injury verification of the diffusionless nature of the transformation. But they still insist that, goodness, that it will be really nice to be able to, inve to, to, to see and to measure the carbon supersaturation in the bionitic ferrite during the reaction uh, when the transformation is taking place. And we thought that the slow transformation kinetics, that it cannot be very sexy for industry, it can be really, really nice to solve this fundamental problem. And here you have, I'm sure that you have already heard about the development of a high carbon, high silicon steel that when transformed at 200 degrees C, evolve the austenite decomposition is a nanostructure mixture of bionitic ferrite and retinal austenite. And the, this is still awaited uh, so much interest in industry because of the mechanical properties. Uh, you will hear in this conference much more about that, much more details. But for me, it was really interesting because, in my opinion, solved the fundamental problem that we have. And you can see, talking about, uh, as I told you, that this is a very uh, slow kinetics process. You can see here on the left some kinetics uh, data. And we are measuring here the evolution of the different phases uh, as a function of time for this high carbon, high silicon steel transforming at 200 degrees C. And the transformation will take place between two and six days. Then I believe that we will have time to look at how uh, the Binary ferrite is the carburizing when the transformation is taking place. That's what we did, and the first thing we did is to use, to use X-ray analysis. And you see here, in green, you see the evolution of the phases. That's the, how the transformation progress. In blue, you see the carbon enrichment in, red, in the retainant austenites. And in red, you see the carbon content in the binary ferrite uh, as a function of time. Uh, again, we, we validate here the, the incomplete reaction phenomenon, and it's quite clear that when we reach the TO value after 150 hours, 
Beyond that point, we don't get additional binary ferrite formation. And we don't get additional carbon enrichment. Then the transformation has stopped. But we were not able to monitor the corresponding decarburization of the binary ferrite. At this point, we knew that X-ray analysis is not the right uh, technique to look at the carbon supersaturation in the binary ferrite. And that's because with X-ray analysis, always we have average values of the carbon content in the in phases in the return austenite or in the binary ferrite. And if we have some local carbon enrichment in our binary ferrite plates, we will catch that carbon in our measurements. Those measurements does not correspond to carbon in solid solution in our binary ferrite. That's how, that's how we approach atom proof tomography. We need a technique uh, that uh, allows us to determine the carbon content locally at the nanoscale and uh, a way of any possible carbon enrichment regions. And here you have a nice example of a needle safe atom proof uh, sample. Um, with this technique, we are able to reconstruct in three dimensions the position of different atoms. Here you can see the carbon map, a uh, carbon distribution map, and every point corresponds to a, a um, carbon atom. But we can have the same information for other substitutional solutes. The big region on the right is a high carbon region, that's retin and austenite, and the low carbon region in the left, that's vanity ferrite. And here, yeah, here in this example, we already have those carbon enriched regions in the binity ferrite close to an interface. This is an austenite binity ferrite interface. What is interesting is that we also can quantify the level of carbon in solid solution in a different phases. And for this particular case that corresponds to a high carbon, high silicon steel transfer at 200 degrees C for 10 days, that's after completion of transformation, the level of carbon in the retinal austenite is comparable to that given by X-ray analysis and the TO value. And the level of, car of carbon away of those carbon enriched regions in the binary ferrite is lower than that given by X-ray analysis, but still higher than that given by the para equilibrium. Then with this technique, we were able to, to see the carbon supersaturation in the binary ferrite. Here you see the results as a function of time. And this is atom proof tomography results. You see again the evolution of the phases as with time. The blue points again correspond to the carbon enrichment on the retin and austenite. It's quite clear here that we have a very wide error bars and we will come later what is the reason for that. Error bars for any time correspond to different um, atom proof samples that have been analyzed. And it seems that we have a huge dispersion of data for a given treatment. But, and it is more clear on the right where I chain the scale on the uh, y-axis that it's quite clear that this time with this technique we can see the decarburization of the binary ferrite and the carbon supersaturation in the binary ferrite is evident during the whole binary uh, reaction. Of course, we were not able to, to see and validate that very early moment with a fully carbon supersaturation in the binary ferrite, with the carbon content of the parent austenite, because we are at 200 degrees C where carbon is still can move. But uh, we are aware that there's low kinetics for binite. It has been always a traditional uh, argument for the diffusion uh, uh, explanation and theory. Uh, and it makes sense because uh, uh, we cannot explain how the carbon can be trapped inside the binary ferrite. The interface is moving so slowly that it's hard to, to understand. For, for this reason, what we did is to perform the same carbon content determinations for three very different steels. A medium carbon, low silicon steel that transferred to upper binite with uh, uh, intralav um, uh, cementite precipitation during binite reaction. 
transformed to lower bainite with inter and intralab precipitation at the same time that the bainite reaction is taking place. Uh, medium carbon high silicon steel that are higher temperatures transformed to carbide free bainite and at lower tem temperatures uh, we have interlap precipitation during the bainite reaction and an additional temperature for the high carbon high silicon steel. The three still have very different kinetics and we are able to track the carbon supersaturation in the bainiferite a, a wide range of transformation temperatures. And you can see here the results. Those results correspond for the end of the transformation. And it was quite evident that uh, for transformation temperatures uh, below 375 or 350 degrees C, even when the reaction has finished, we uh, still can detect and observe the carbon supersaturation in the bainitic ferrite. The carbon content in the bainitic ferrite for higher temperatures approach already the equilibrium. But what is interesting is that the tendency for the carbon supersaturation in the binding ferrite as a function of temperature is, is quite similar for higher and lower temperatures. It's a continuous behavior. And it's independent of the cement, of, of if we have or not precipitation during the binary reaction at the same time. In my opinion, what uh, we have here is enough evidence, experimental evidence, that binding ferrite grows supersaturated in carbon. But when we transform the steel at higher transformation temperatures, all the secondary processes that, I co that are controlled by carbon diffusion are activated. And what processes are they? We have investigated those processes at, uh, at the atomic scale as well. First of all is the carbon partitioning uh, from the bainitiferite into the retained austenite. And, uh, to I can investigate that, uh, we, we were able to, to detect uh, that uh, in bainite microstructure, and these samples correspond to the high carbon, high silicon steel, transfer a very low temperature, but it's not uh, exclusive of this very sophisticated steel. It happened also for submicron carbide free bainite, that uh, different sites of retin and austenite trap very different amount of carbon contents. And, um, Blocky austenite, they have much lower carbon content that is in micron or nanoscale fields of retinal austenite. And that's really beautiful for our microstructure because we know that uh, with uh, carbon, we can stabilize, uh, mechanically stabilize of our austenite. And that's a way with a wide range of size of austenite and a wide range of carbon content, we are able to control and to have a progressive trip effect that that allow us to enhance ductility and toughness in these types of steels. But look to this transmission electron microwaves because it's quite clear that uh, close to the ferrite austenite interface, in bionitic uh, uh, structure, we have a high dislocation density. And when the carbon is moving from the center of the bionitic ferrite to the, into the retinal austenite, it will find this free space. And is not a strain what we found by the corresponding atom proof tomography. That is, that carbon will segregate on those dislocations. And think about that, it's an, we have an extra strengthening in our microstructure through cultural atmospheres. And finally, depending on uh, the transformation temperature and the precipitation kinetics, maybe cementite can form before that carbon will escape from the binary ferrite. In that case, we will have interlap precipitation in the ferrite and what we have, what we all know by lower bainite. I, I believe that uh, at this moment, we have plenty of experimental evidence that, uh, that uh, we can state that binary transformation is displacive and diffusionless in nature. Thank you very much, Francisca. Very, uh, very entertaining talk as well. Thank you very much. Um, throw it open to the floor, as we have done so far today. Is there any questions? Yep. You talked about dislocations accumulating in the retained austenite. I wanted to ask, 
Do you notice that any work has been done where the slip can transmit from the austenite back into the ferrite? Are those interfaces opaque or, or transparent to glide? Yeah, th those dislocations are generated by the plastic accommodation of a retained austenite during binite reaction. But uh, if we think in the, in the um, crystal crystallography, a match between our binity ferrite and the uh, ret parent retinal austenite, uh, we have some possible um, mm, planes in matches that uh, it, it can give us the idea that those dislocations can be heritage and transfer from the retinal austenite to the binity ferrite. Francisco, you showed a very nice graph with the carbon and ferrite going very low, continuously going up to all the way to C bar, probably, finally, when it reaches the modern city transformation. So there was a work long time back then on the coupled diffusional displacive growth. Can we develop a model rather than calling Benedict ferrite and modern site as a continuous flux going from zero okay, to? Okay, this is a chemical analysis, a carbon in our Benedict ferrite. We don't have crystallographic information in atom proof tomography. But uh, nowadays, there are investigations on what is the crystallography of that uh, ferrite that is trapping so much carbon. That's one approach to the question that you said, why so much carbon? And another approach that I think that uh, we couldn't forget is that when we see the homogeneous distribution of carbon in the binity ferrite by atom proof tomography, it looked like it's in solid solution. And I don't doubt that, but we still have also vacancies, as in a martensitic still. And if I have a vacancy in a vinitic region, I ensure that carbon will be comfortable as well, but I'm not going to notice. When it is in these locations, we can notice. But when it is in a vacancy, it's not. Then I'm thinking on different systems, uh, BCT, F uh, BCT, FCC, but why not BCC? FCT vacancy system to explain that level of carbon in our structure. So there is no tetragonal team. There is no what? Tetragonal team. Uh, Harry has been investigating that and it's not evident so far. Calculations can be an explanation, but experimental evidence are not conclusive yet. First of all, uh, your original question. Uh, so there's no evidence for continuity. Otherwise, there's nothing to stop the reaction from proceeding to the para-equilibrium curve. And the evidence for tetragonality is the inscripta, experimental evidence. Well, you, didn't, you were not very clear in your conclusion. <laughs> Uh, uh, okay. Enrichment of carbon atoms at the gram, uh, dislocations. Yes. Does it involve uh, diffusion, diffusion, diffusion of carbon? But uh, yeah. your conclusion is that without diffusion. Yeah, yeah. That you you were right. That uh, yeah. since we have dislocation at the interface, carbon partitioning into the retained and austenite uh, into the residual austenite is not as high as we were. We can expect. And uh, it's, it's like uh, how much carbon can transfer, it will be lower. Yes. So uh, uh, enrichment of carbon, it, uh, it needs a diffusion. And uh, another question. Oh, yeah, yeah, but those secondary okay. processes. I understand your point. Yeah. And uh, another question is uh, uh, formation of a nuclear, nucleus of carbide. It also needs okay. a jump of carbon atoms. That, uh, it's uh, impossible. Okay, we, we have seen in the uh, in the bionic structures, w if uh, we have seen the carbon supersaturated in the bionic ferrite, the enriched retinal austenite, the dislocations with the carbon. If we have a, a cementite precipitation, interlaced cementite precipitation, that is evident by TEN or atom proof tomography. But in terms of nanoclusters or cluster, carbon cluster, what we have seen is that uh, with longer agents, uh, much later than the transformation has complete or during a subsequent temporary, those 
uh, carbon enriched dislocation evolve in carbon clusters and those carbon clusters we believe are the perfect nucleation plate for epsilon carbides. Uh, thank you very much, very nice presentation and clear. I have a, just a, a, a question. Is, uh, you show in the analysis uh, that uh, for thinner ozonite grains, yes. you have more carbon than yes. for like, thicker. Do you have any comment about that? Yeah, it's a question that uh, how far the return ozonite is on the progression of the mm, reaction. Then by, uh, those uh, submicron or nanoscale fields are between binary ferrite plates and blocks are between sieves and can be observed uh, by light optical microwave. But uh, we have a maximum volume fraction of binite that can be four, <coughs> according to the incomplete reaction phenomenon. And those blocks will be the remainder of the night. Um, yeah, lovely work. Um, the idea is of high silicon is to suppress cementite formation. And you showed a nice image of a very small cementite particle. Is it surrounded by an enriched area of silicon? Uh, did the silicon actually have to diffuse out of the way at 200 degrees C to allow the, the cementite to form? OK, I believe that this particular case, you can see that uh, the silicon we can consider is homogeneously distributed and is trapped inside the cementite particle. It's a para-equilibrium cementite particle. Thank Interlaced you. precipitate. Uh, we have some questions from um, the guy from internet. Um, Sujay Shaka um, <laughs> asked, uh, what is your thought for low carbon steel where the bainite transformation happened at higher temperature, especially for upper bainite? Uh, do you still believe the, that upper bainite is a displacive in nature? Okay, I agree that uh, the carbon supersaturation super study has, uh, we didn't go lower in carbon content than 0.3 weight percent. And I believe it can be mar much more complex because we have a, a higher variety of uh, morphologies and everything. But I believe what uh, uh, Professor Jam saw us today, granular by night is, uh, it can be a plague like by night and it can be for by the same mechanism. Uh, I agree that uh, we don't have experimental evidence now on the, on the table, but I believe we have a, a wide range of temperatures and we can think that uh, we will have the binitiferite growth by the diffusionless process and other secondary processes will be anticipated even earlier and earlier the higher the transformation temperature. I believe that uh, there is no very, there is no different types of by night. It's just by night. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, your work is based on a mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite. Uh, what about classic bainite? This means a mixture of uh, ferrite, bainite, and carbide. Uh, do you observe the same enrichment of um, ferrite? Yeah, that's the reason why we test the medium carbon low silicon steel, which is a conventional bainitic steel. That transform uh, between 375 degrees C and 525 degrees C. And you have in this slide, I don't know if we can point out what the slide, we have two examples of transformation for that steel, 500 and 375. 500 is a conventional upper by night, and 375 is a conventional lower by night. And carbon supersaturation was not detected because this cementite precipitation uh, was carbon supersaturation correspond to those blue points, but it still certain carbon supersaturation for 375. But of course, for higher transformation temperatures, all these precipitation processes take the carbon away of the carbon in binitiferite, and we cannot detect because it's already precipitated. Okay, we just about have time for one more quick question, so. Yeah, thanks. So at the end of your presentation, you mentioned about the crystallography of the ferrite. So this is related with plasticity or is related with uh, carbon segregation towards interface? Because if it's uh, carbon segregation, let's play any role, then maybe you should take a look at the uh, interface 
And then the question is, how are you going to do it by APP? Okay, uh, the third one in buying this right, I think that we have evidence by atom flux tomography that is homogeneously distributed. There is not carbon segregation at the interface, as a carbon peak at the interface. What we have at the interface, and that can make very difficult the, the crystallography analysis, uh, uh, is that we have at the interface a high dislocation density. And for high resolution TN, it can be really uh, hard to determine the actual structure. Apart of the carbon supersaturation, we create also distortion in the binary ferrite. So it's mainly plasticity, <coughs> what you consider? But uh, I don't know what you mean with I mean plasticity. This activity. Oh, this location at the interface. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll have to leave it there and move on. So uh, we could all show our appreciation for Francisco. <laughs> <laughs>